Okay, we're starting. <laughs> so last time we didn't really do anything. We're actually going to do something today. Um, we're going to move on to functions. We're starting the first section, the syllabus 1.1 functions and their representation. Um, so, at my website, if you guys have the syllabus, I posted already a blank version of the quiz and a quiz and a version with answers. Um, so the quiz did not count towards their grade; it was a diagnostic. But I do highly recommend that you go over the quiz over the weekend and actually try all the problems because the, the skills you need to solve those problems they are important, um, as you will very soon find out. And so go over the blank version, try to actually redo it on your own, then you can check your answers with the answers on the quiz. And um, yeah, if you have any questions after that, after trying it on your own, then you can talk to me and meet me in my office hours or something like that. Um, so on the website currently, there's also the first five sections of the textbook are there in PDF form. So if you haven't gotten the textbook, you can start on the homework. Um, so this, another copy of the syllabus is there, a blank version of the quiz as well as the part version with answers as well as a link to the videos. Did anyone see the first video? Did anyone watch the first one? No? Okay, so I was going to ask if the view was okay, but I guess no one knows. So let's hope this, this actually works out and you guys can actually read this when I do it. Um, but yeah, so, and again, remember it's javon.org slash teaching and then you can find all the materials for the class um, there. So let's actually just jump into it. What's a function? Let's start there. What is a function? Yeah. A set of values for x. A set of values for x, not quite. Um, what what is x in your interpretation? Well, or points. Okay. Um, will you more describe what a domain is, but the domain of what is a function, yeah? Is it like input and output? It has inputs and outputs. It's only with inputs and outputs. How? What kind of thing, yeah? Uh, well, I was going to say um, a domain for which every value of x only has one value of y. OK. Uh, so what's the function in that part, yeah? It's um, an equation where it corresponds to a graph given if you put in specific points. An equation that corresponds to a graph, not quite. You guys are all hovering around it, but not quite, because that's an equation. It corresponds to a graph. It's not a function. Yeah. Is it like a relationship between points? It's a relationship between? Uh, points or, I don't know. Yeah. X and Y values? <coughs> it's a relationship between X and Y values. What kind of relationship between X and Y values? Because this is a relationship between X and Y values. Why is it not a function? What makes something a function specifically? It can't repeat x values for, or y values for an x value. Right. Um, there is only one output for each individual input. The reason why this is not a function is because for some particular x value here, there are two possibilities for the y values. That's why it's not a function. Okay. So a function is a relationship. It is a rule that connects two groups of things, right? So we have one group which we call the domain, which they're represented by the x values, and there's another group called the codomain, and that's where we find our y values. X and y do, don't have to be used, so you probably don't want to think of it in terms of only x and y. But yes, it's a relationship that connects two groups in a very specific way. Every single element in one group is assigned only one person in the next group, okay? And that is what makes a function. So it's a very particular kind of relationship, a very particular kind of rule. So let's start there. So definition, a function is a rule that assigns to each, as in every, element in one set, we call this set the domain, exactly one element in another set, we call
call this set the code of The set of elements in the code domain that are assigned form another set that we call the range. So that's a function, a relationship between two groups of things that has that particular criteria. Every single element in one group is assigned exactly one element in the other group. Okay, so pictorial representation of a function is just, I have a bunch of things in this group, and I connect all of them, each and every one of them, to one other thing in another group. It's possible that something over here has two things from over here going there, but it's important that everyone here only has one line emanating to the other group. Right? You could all pick the same guys, but this is an example of a function. All right, so this is an example of a function. Another example would be you can have each individual thing going to a different thing. This group here, the group where we are making the connections, they, they're called the set of inputs or the domain. So it's called the domain. This is called the codomain. Okay. Now I can have things in here that are not assigned, but the things that are assigned, they form their own group, and I call those the range. All right, so the range are the guys that actually are actually connected. You can have guys that are not in the range, but are in the codomain. So that's a function. Um, something that is not a function. Can you tell me why this is not a function? There's one guy here that no, has no assignment. <coughs> Each element in the domain must have an assignment. I must connect everyone in this group to someone over there. I don't have to choose everyone over here, but everyone over here must have a choice. Okay. Um, why is this not a function? No. Uh, the first point in the domain has two connected points. In the so the domain. first point here is connected to two different things, which means if I use that as an input, there are two possible outputs. That does not work with a function. In a function, you must have only one element that is an output. So a function describes a very particular kind of relationship, a very particular kind of connection between two groups of things. Okay. We call those functions. And many things have our, we can consider functions. It's not only a mathematical thing, there are many things in, in life that can be modeled by functions. And we'll do a problem today where you actually see that happen. Right? But this is what a function is, a very particular kind of relationship between two groups. That is what a function is. What else do you want? Um, um, some more terminology. X. Usually, not always, represents an arbitrary domain element. is, you might refer to it as the input, you might also refer to it as a domain element. Um, I will also commonly refer to it as what's called the independent variable. Right? Um, 
one thing I do want to emphasize, it does not have to be literally the letter X. I could call any other letter this, but once I would define it as the independent variable, you'll know, oh, it takes the role of X as I normally use it. Um, <coughs> y usually means the, what we call the dependent variable. basically me saying, okay, this guy is representing output, represents outputs, or the dependent variable. f is the name of my function. This is a function called f. And x represents my input variable. So f is a rule that I plug in input x, and then my y value, which is the output, depends on the thing I plugged in in the first place. So a common um, exceptional thing is, you think of x, you plug it into this machine, which is called f. It does some rule based on some sort of assignment uh, protocol, and it outputs y, and it will output, spit out one thing for each one thing that you plug in. Right? This is a function. Right? This is some of the notation and the, and the names and the vocabulary that are important. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure at some point you guys have seen all this, but I just want to remind you of what we call these things and some common notations that we use. Okay? So that's what a function is. We're actually going to use a function to solve the problem. functions and their representation, so that's what a function is. Let's talk about some representations. If we have this kind of relationship and we want to model it, how are some ways that we can represent this relationship? Happen. Okay. So, one way is to do what we call a mapping diagram. This is one way that a function can be represented. This is basically what I drew before, right? So, I literally draw two groups. And I can connect things from one group to another group, one at a time. So let's say this is 2, and this is 3, and this is 4. And so this is describing a function f. What is the rule here? Can you see the rule? Yeah? f of x equals x plus 1. x plus 1. So the rule here is to add 1. Okay. So I plug something in. It adds one to it, it spits something out. So if I plug in one, the output is two. Plug in two, the output is three. Plug in three, the output is four. And I can represent it by literally drawing this picture. And it can go on and on. 
So that's one way to represent a function by drawing a mapping diagram. Another way to represent a function is a table. So I can literally, literally write my x values in one, my y value in another one. One, two, three. This will go to two, three, four. This is also the rule, add one. And I can represent it in a table. And in this column, there should be no repeats. So if you have a table of values, you know one of them. Does this represent a function? Everyone in your domain should appear here, and they should appear one time. That's how you know it's not a function. If something appears more than once, or something doesn't appear at all, it's not a function. So you have a table of values. It could be numbers, it could be names, it could be colors, it could be literally anything. But if it has those properties, you can. there's a function that you can describe it as. Okay. Another way to represent a function is a um, set of ordered pairs. Ordered pairs is a fancy name for coordinates. So you can write it as a set of coordinates. So for example, I can again look at the rule that says add one. And I can say, oh, my f is going to be a set of these coordinates. One goes to two, two goes to three, three goes to four, etc. Right, so I can write out a list of things. In the first coordinate is your input. And in the second coordinate is your output. Right. And then one should only be the first coordinate in the entire group. So I can represent it as a list of points. And so I can represent a function as a list. You can also represent a function verbally, right? Which is it's useful to explain a function in words if you want to. It'll help you in word prompts by translating it. So literally like add one. It would be, what's the rule? Add one. I can describe it in words. Um, another way is to do it algebraically. By the way, that's just a fancy word for using formulas. So for example, this rule, add 1, I can write it as f of x equals x plus 1. And that's how I can write the rule, add 1, as a formula. Right? I write a mathematical operation that describes what the rule is doing. Right? And I can name it at the same time and tell you what my input is. And if I want to, I can say equals y, and that's me naming what the output is. Um, very useful expression of a function. Most of the time in this class, we will be expressing functions using formulas. Six is also a very common way, and it's a very useful way. And this is using graphs. You can use graphs to represent functions. So let's say I have f of x equals x plus 1. How would this graph look? Linear. It's linear. What goes on the horizontal? The x. The x, right? You always put the input on the horizontal, or whatever you're describing the input to be. The output goes on the vertical. And you can start by plotting coordinates. So you can start by 1, and realize it goes to 2, so that's 1.2. Um, goes to 3, 3, 4, 5, 6. And you can connect all these. You'll realize that they'll all connect with a line. And that picture will represent the function. How you know a function, a, a graph represents a function, it passes what we call the vertical line test. Which means no matter where I draw a vertical line, it will touch the function at most one time. A circle is not a function because I can draw a vertical line that can touch it in multiple places. Right? And anything else that, ha that happens, I, you will get something that's not a function. Right? Graphs also are very important. So usually if you're given descri described a function is described to you in any one of the previous four ways, your goal would be to rewrite it in one of these two ways to be able to answer a particular question.
five and six, most common. And most useful. So let's actually jump into the deep end here. Let's struggle our way through a word problem, which we're going to solve using functions, and to see if you know how to actually interpret these things. So here's the example. It's going to be a word problem, so we're going to have to write it. Teaching is in Kutney. I have to sell hot dogs on the weekend to, you know, kind of make it. Okay. Here are some things that I've learned statistically speaking, right? So I've been selling hot dogs for a while and I notice a few things. If I sell it for $2 per hot dog, he sells 80 hot dogs in a day. $3 per hot dog. He sells 50 in a day. So that's the scenario. Okay, I have a hot dog stand. If I charge $2 per hot dog, 80 people will buy from me. If I sell $3 per hot dog, only 50 people will buy from me. That's the scenario. Eight. Let's actually just start to introduce some notation. Find a function h of p to be the number of hot dogs sold in a day at price p. Interpret. And when I say interpret, I mean in words h of 3. Tell me in words what h of 3 would represent. Yeah. Should we, do we know what price you decided to sell the hot dogs at? No, no. I know these two things. What does h of 3 mean? It's, it's the amount of money you make after selling three hot dogs. Is it? Oh, at price oh, P. No. How was, how was, how would de do we define H? Oh, that's the number of hot dogs. Number of hot dogs. So that, how would you express that? So, so the number of hot dogs you would make if you sold them for three dollars a piece. What's the number of hot dogs? Sold at three dollars per hot dog. And that's how you would interpret that in this language, with that notation. Okay. B. are the only two prices I will sell at, what would be the domain and range of this function as defined? Yes? The domain is 2 to 3. The domain of h is 2 and 3. And the range is um, 50 to 80. Range of h is 
50 to 80. Well, 50 and 80. Why, why, why did you say that? How do you know that? Because um, your two inputs are 2 and 3. And you know my inputs are the 2 and 3. Because, um, because that's P. That's what you put into the function. This notation, remember the name of the function comes on the outside, what we put in parentheses is the input value, right? Remember y equals f of x? Mm -hmm. So in this case, p is my input, which means for my domain, I should be putting p values, as in price values. So it's the two and the three. That would be in the domain. And h represents the number of hot dogs, that's my output, so that would be the 50 and the 80. That's the range, right? So in this scenario, if I define a function to capture this idea, then that would be the domain, that would be the range, and in fact this function would look something like the 2 would be connected to 80, and the 3 would be connected to 50. Under the function H, right? I just described that relationship. Right? So I'm making a connection. Yeah? Um, so is that supposed to be P? What? The domain is the set of P values, okay. and the range would be the set of H values, the number of hot dog values. Right, this is the group of inputs, the group of outputs. My inputs is the price, my output is how much hot dogs I sell. So why would I define such a function? Well, that's what part C is about. So this is the main crux of the problem. Let's see um, what we can do here. Let's make some assumptions under the following assumptions. to you and I describe my dilemma. You know, I haven't gotten a lot of sleep because I have to work all weekend. You tell you, yeah, I have this hot dog stand on the weekend, you know, I charge two dollars and this is how much I sell, I charge three dollars and this is how much I sell. Are those the best prices? Should I be selling at two dollars or three dollars? Something else probably? And I, help me out. What, what should I, what, how should I um, price my hot dogs? How would you give me an answer? Yeah? Just multiply how much you're selling each hot dog by, by how many you're selling, and find how much money you're making. What is that called? Do you know it's, the name of that? It's a, it's a linear function. Yeah, well, you know what the name of that is? Evaluate. <coughs> is it a linear function? Evaluate. What? No, he just described something to do that determines how much money I make. He said, mm -hmm. multiply Max. the price I'm selling each hot dog by how many I'm selling. Maximizing your you know the technical term for that? Well, it's not profit technically. Optimization. No, but you, what, what's the thing? Optimization? No. <laughs> it's something besides profit. We haven't covered it yet, but I want to see if oh, anyone knows. Like net gain? It's called revenue, the oh, yeah. technical yeah. term for it. So if you're talking about how much money you're making, it's called revenue. Profit is when you take your revenue and subtract the costs. Right, so if I'm worried about, oh, it costs me this much to sell a hot dog and I make this much money, what's my profit? I subtract the two. Okay, but it's called revenue. The money you make is the revenue. Okay, so how do you interpret best price here? Well, we have no information about cost, so I'll just interpret it. The best price is the one I can make the most revenue from. So basically, that's what I'm asking. If I ask you, what's the best price for me to sell at? You should answer to me the price that gives me the most revenue. What is going to be the price that gives me the most revenue? Two dollars. Why would you say that? Because 80 times 2 is $160, mm -hmm. and 50 times 3 is $150. Okay. Yeah, of these two prices, it would be better for me to sell at $2. But was that the question I asked? No, because you can 
fluctuate. I'm willing to vary the price. Yeah. I'm willing to sell for something other than two or three dollars. So the question is, should I sell it at one of these two or something else? And if something else, what is that other thing? That's what I'm asking. How do we go about that? Yeah? You have to define the function with um So you're gonna define another function? You okay. have to um like you have to give it a formula. Okay, and what's the formula? Um F wait, wait, where H of P equals um So first you have to interpret uh best price. What was the best price that we wanted to know? The thing that maximizes revenue, right? Notice here we want maximum revenue. So let's start there. Um, what is revenue? If I talk about revenue, how do you find revenue? Well, you, you already said it. Basically figure out the number of hot dogs sold and you multiply it by the price per hot dog. That's how much money I make. In other words, it's H times P, HP. Okay, what do I do with that? What am I after? You're after a, well, if, it's, if it is a linear relationship, you need a, an intercept too. Where it crosses the y axis. I feel like I'm getting ahead of, ahead of the. Because, like, I take, like, I know what a linear relationship is, but I don't know how to explain it in terms. Yeah, I know we're, we're kind of skipping ahead, but I just want to see where you guys' reasoning are. So, what did I ask for? The best price, which means what am I looking for? What value? Yeah? Um, do you want to stay in the given domain range? Or domain no, range? I can. Okay. Get out of it. Um, so you want to find out what two values you can plug in to get the maximum revenue. Yes. Yeah. But you have to, um, you have to give it like a, I'm still on like giving it a certain formula and then Give what a formula? The whole process of selling okay. to people. Okay, how do we get that formula? Um, H of P, or is it, oh, Do you have an idea? It's, well, the, the actual linear function for the the hot dog sold versus price is negative thirty x plus one forty. Okay, how did you get that, and how did you know you had to get that? Well, to find the price, you have to multiply uh, number of hot dogs sold times price. Mm -hmm. But we can't um, we can't we can't just we can't uh, uh, again. Like I'm trying to find a way to explain this, but you can't uh, multiply. Uh, we need another, we, uh, there's too many variables. There are too many variables, yeah. okay. Which variable so, do we want? Which just is, X. Just the uh, price. Just P, okay. So, yeah. so these are parts to interpreting a problem. First, you have to understand the situation. Second, you need to know, what am I after? You are asked, what is the best price? Price is represented by P. In other words, I need to find a P value. I, at the end of the day, I need to say, P equals this, and that's the best price. This is the form that I need to know my revenue. Here's a P, what is that? H. I don't care about H, what is H? You need to get rid of H, the answer needs to be in terms of P. All right, so that's the first thing. So now, I'm going to want to rewrite this in a more convenient form. I want to rewrite that in terms of P. Now how do I get to H in terms of P? If H is the number of hot dogs, and I know H and P have a linear relationship, how would I get to what that is? Yeah? I feel like substitute, it's it. H equal to, you can divide revenue by P and then get. Yeah. yeah, but I also don't know what the revenue function is. Using the information we have so far. These are all, this is all the information I have so far. When the price is $2, I sell 80 hot dogs. When the price is $3, I sell 50 hot dogs. Price and the number of hot dogs sold has a linear relationship. How do I describe that relationship? Ideas. Could you set up an equation where you have just hot dogs and price based on the information that you give? Yes, that is what I want. How, how do you get that? How do you get to that? You 
have it's there's a form for when your relation is y equals n x plus b. Okay. So then your x would be price, and your y would be hot dog. So okay. Plug those numbers in. No, first you need to find the slope. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, yeah, now we're getting somewhere. Yeah. Okay. All right. I think you already have the answer, so I don't want you to. I don't want you to tell. Okay. So. Let's start by, start where we are. Um, probably one of the best things to realize where we are is, remember one of the, what I said last time? Five and six are the most convenient ways to represent functions. Either you want to find out a picture or a formula that describes the situation. Let's start with a picture. And these are the two things I know. Remember on the horizontal is always the independent variable that's represented by P. On the vertical will be the output, which is going to be my h. I know that when my p is 2, my h is 80. So that's one point on this function. I know that when my p is 3, my h is 50. That's another point on this function. I'm also told that they have a linear relationship. All that means is that they're connected by a straight line. So that describes the function of h in terms of p. Now the question is, can I have a formula for it? It's a straight line, as you said. It's a line. So we know what formula it has. It has to have h equals m p plus p, right? y equals mx plus p. Okay. Um, m is the slope. How do we find the slope of a straight line? Change y over change x. Change in y over change in x, rise over run, or y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. So go here. Okay, m is going to be y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. In this case, we can say that's 80 minus 50 over 2 minus 3, and that's, that's negative 30. Given that, how do we find the line, the equation? Take that form, and now that you have the slope, take a known point to solve for b. Okay. So, um, so you can use that y equals mx plus b thing, right? So we know that your m is minus 30. We'll take an x value, which is, say, 2, and the corresponding y value, which is 8, right? So we'll plug those in. 80 would be equal to minus 30 times 2 plus b. So our B would be 80 plus 60, which is 140. And so you can get to the formula H is equal to minus 30 P plus 140. And that's the relationship between H and P. It is a function, and it is a linear function. There's another way you could do this. Um, it's equivalent, um, but sometimes I, I prefer the formula in this version. It's y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. Have you guys seen the equation of the line in that version? So uh, this is called the slope intercept form for the equation of the line. This is called the point slope form of the equation of the line. Um, this is usually more convenient if I don't require you to solve for the y in the end, and I just want you to get the form. We'll talk about that later. But yeah, you'll have y minus 80 equals minus 30 x minus 2. So that's y minus 80 equals minus 30 x plus 60. And so your y would be minus 30 x plus 60. Add 80 to both sides. And so again, I'll end up with the same value. But there are many cases in which I wouldn't really care about you getting here. That would be okay as an answer, and so this would be right. You don't have to solve for another derivative when you get it right away. But at the end of the day, yes, now we know what h is. h is going to be this guy. So if I have a price, I can figure out what the, how many hot dogs I sell, right? If I plug in $2 for the price, I end up selling 80. If I plug in $3 for the price, I end up selling uh, 50, right? And it will be described by this relationship. Now what? Yes. So if you, you want to find the max revenue, yeah. You need a revenue function. Okay, so I need so a revenue function. Solve, can, you, can you substitute your h? Yeah, h is this, so I can take this 
and put it here. Yeah. Can't get rid of this graph. So this is the next step now. So my revenue function is going to be minus 30p plus 140 times p. What kind of function is that? Quadratic. It's a quadratic function. Yeah, quadratic. Uh, how do I know it's quadratic? Because when you distribute your, your p. If I distribute, I get minus 30p squared plus 140p. And that has a form of a quadratic, right? ax squared plus bx plus c. What does this look like? Yeah. Well, it's an inverted. Uh, it's an inverted what? parabola because it's a negative. Okay. So we know so it's, it's like something a, that looks like this, right? Mm -hmm. It's a parabola, and it's negative in front of the squared term, so it must be upside down. Now, can you see what we're after? The vertex. The vertex. The, vertex. the highest point on a parabola is called the vertex. So it turns out answering the question, what is the best price, is equivalent to answering the question, what is the vertex of this problem? Right? Next question, how do we find the vertex of a problem? <laughs> yeah. B over 2A. Minus B over 2A. The formula for the input for the vertex of a problem is the input value must be minus b over 2a, which in this case, the b, the a is the coefficient of the square term, b is the coefficient of the linear term, and c would be the constant, c is 0 in this case, but um, we don't need it anyway. So it's minus b divided by 2 times a. The negatives cancel, and so this becomes 14 over 6, which is 7 over 3. What is that? You can write that in one intuitive terms, in terms of money, what is 7 over 3? 2 dollars and 33 cents is the best price to sell the hot dogs. So under these assumptions, assuming that price and the number of hot dogs I sell has a linear relationship, and assuming that if I charge 2 dollars I will sell 80 and if I charge 3 dollars I will sell 50, the best price to sell it for is $2.33. I will make the most money by selling it for that price. And I answered that using functions. See how these guys can be useful, right? All you do is come up with an interpretation of the problem, right? So if someone asks you, what should I sell the hot dogs for? Okay, you start by setting up a function. Let H be the number of hot dogs you sell. Then you come up, okay, we want to maximize revenue. That has its own function. And then you kind of you deal with that as, you, as it comes along. But that's the important thing. Um, another question. Maybe some of you have taken calculus already, so you already know the answer. But if I were to use calculus to help me solve this problem, at what point would I have used it? We didn't need to use it here, but let's say I, I was forced to use it. Someone said, use calculus to find the best price. Where would calculus have been involved here? Then yeah. find where um, the rate of change is zero of your parabola. OK. Your, Tell me in equivalently which part in this process that would have helped us with. Yeah. I guess you can take the derivative of, the, of that quadratic and you can find the slope is zero. OK. And that would give us what point? The vertex. The vertex. So literally, if I were forced to use calculus, calculus would have happened right here. Everything else was algebra, right? And so that's why I said in the first um, first day, students, if you do bad in calculus, algebra is your problem. In a major problem, calculus is only usually going to help you with one tiny little part of it. But being able to set up that function, being able to draw that graph, being able to figure out the points and come up with this, being able to know that you're after the vertex, all that stuff around it was algebra. You use the calculus for this one little part. Okay. Now, why you would use calculus here we didn't need to is because what if this wasn't a quadratic? What if it was some other random crazy function where you don't have a general formula? That's where calculus is useful. Being able to find the highest point or the lowest point of something Calculus is what you can use that. Differential calculus, more specifically. Okay. So in all of this, if we were to use calculus, it would have only happened here. But if you if you suck at algebra, you wouldn't get it in the first place. 
Okay, so it's very important that you go over the stuff for the first quiz and really know your algebra, know how to draw graphs, know about straight lines, about quadratics, about the general formulas, quadratic formula, how to find a vertex, how to factor a quadratic, how to draw a quadratic, how to know when you're looking for a vertex as opposed to an intercept or something else. Things like these will be important. Okay. So that's us using algebra to solve a word problem. And in particular, it's, it's using functions to be able to solve something where a lot of times uh, students think of math as something that's really hard or difficult or why do we need it. Turns out to do it without math would have been a lot more difficult, which uh, the, one of my students in the class I had just before this, I'd made a suggestion. Well, just keep moving the price and then see how many hot dogs you sell. Which is possible. It is a way of solution. It's trial and error. That's the scientific method, <laughs> right? But you could have known the answer right away without doing that. Oh, charge $2.01, $2.02, $2.03 until you hit the sweet spot. You know, which is, it, it, is, it, is, a, it is an option, but it's not the, the best option. illustrating some uses of functions there. But that was a really hefty example, I have to admit. So if you didn't fully understand it, don't worry too much about it. Just make sure that you go over it this weekend as, as well as when you're going over the quiz. And you should be fine. Make sure you understand play by play why I did what I did when I did it. And if you don't, you can ask me about it. Um, but for now, we're going to move on. We're going to talk about evaluated functions. To actually use the function to answer a problem, now we're going to talk about evaluating functions and what does that mean. To evaluate a function, basically, you, is to figure out the output or some particular input, right? The specific value. Uh, if you have a formula, you do this by just plugging in the input into the formula and computing the output. <laughs> I give you a function, f of x equals x squared plus x plus 1, and I ask you to evaluate a f of 1. In other words, when the input is 1, what is the output? Some things to know. Um, notice that the thing I was plugging in, I put it in parentheses. It will avoid you a lot of headache for you to just know to do that. Right? So one of the cases in which you want to use parentheses is when you're evaluating functions. Second, plug in one for every instance of x. That's how you evaluate functions. You really want to think of this thing as a placeholder, right? So 
um, really it's f of blah whatever is equal to blah squared plus blah plus 1. Right? And you realize whatever I put here, put it here, put it here. Everywhere I see an x, I'm going to put that thing that I put in parentheses. And that is called evaluating the function. What is f of 3? How do you get it? Well, it's um, 3 squared plus 3 plus 1. And that would give you 13, the lucky number. Okay. f of a squared, what is that? A squared. a squared squared plus a squared plus one. What is a squared squared? Thank you. A to the fourth. What is a cube squared? It is six. six. Okay, you multiply the powers, right? You don't raise the power to the other. When you have something to a power, raise to another power, you multiply the power. Just want to make sure you know that because. 2 times 2 is, it happens to be the same as 2 squared, so I wanted you to know I multiply them. Okay. So you get that. What is f of minus a squared? Minus a squared squared. Plus minus a squared is 1. a to the fourth minus a squared plus 1. Now, had you not put this in, it would have been a different story. Because that Parentheses. Would be, that would be a negative okay. a to the fourth, right? Yeah, so that's kind of like what we saw in the quiz. I don't remember the particular <coughs> number, but the difference between 3 squared and minus 3 squared, right? This one is minus 9, while this one is positive 9. You need to know the difference. And be careful. And how you know when to use which is you need to know when to use parentheses and if you're evaluating a function, just put things in parentheses so you won't ever have that mixed up. So if on a quiz I asked you this and someone had negative 8 to the fourth in this answer, I'd know exactly what mistake you made. Not using your parentheses. Okay. Uh, I erased the function. How about this one? What is f of x plus h? x plus h squared plus x plus h plus 1. x plus h squared plus x plus h plus 1. I take what's in the parentheses, and every instance of x, I plug it in. Uh, can we simplify that? We simplify this. That's x squared plus a squared, right? No. No. X squared plus 2x squared plus No. I wanted someone to say yes. I throw the chalk. It's like, what did I tell you? That's x squared. Plus 2x h. Plus 2x h. Plus h squared. Plus x plus h plus 1. You have to foil that out. You multiply out. But at, at this point, you should know the form for a plus b all squared is a squared plus 2 b plus b squared. Um, can we combine anything? No. What is f of smiley face? Smiley face. <laughs> is that correct? No. No, what's wrong with it? Parentheses around the smiley face. Okay. I say that because there are times where you're going to be faced with problems. And they're going to look scary. But really, the, it's simple to get rid of. Like, I can tell someone that, and then I ask them, oh, what's f of the cube root of x to the fourth plus radical 2? And they're like, I don't know what that even means. It doesn't matter what it means. You take this, you put it here, take this, put it there, put them in parentheses, done. OK, I want you to get that idea through your head. It's never going to be more complicated than that. OK? It doesn't matter how scary something looks. Right? There are these rules and procedures. This is just it's how it works. Why does it have to work that way? Well, you have to become a math teacher. <laughs> take, like, <laughs> take like calculus 5 and you'll realize why do things have to be that way. For now, that's how they are. So. Okay. There's a 
Castle is five. It was a joke, right? Uh, no, you have a lot of jokes. Okay. In my school, we have four. I think here they have four as well. Uh, what I want to talk about now is what's called the different portion. We'll return to this later. But it's an expression that you have or should have seen before. Um, but you probably don't know where it comes from. And I'd actually tell you this class where it comes from. Um, for a function, f of x, its difference quotient, as it's called, is, does anyone know what the difference quotient is? Yeah? Is it um, f of x plus h plus f of x or minus f of x? Minus f of x. E, uh, all over h. All over h. That expression is called the difference quotient for f of x. There are two um, ways it's usually written. You could have something that also like f of b minus f of a over b minus a. Now, at some point in algebra class and pre-calculus class, you would have seen that expression. They'll give you a function and say, compute the difference quotient. And you have to do this for whatever reason. Um, in this class, I'm going to tell you where that came from. But for now, let's actually play around with it a little bit. Um, this guy's most common. The most common version they use. Um, this one is, is used mostly if they're talking about average rate of change. But that's more for traditional reasons. They're both equivalent. They're exactly the same formula. You just use a notational switch, and you get from one version to the other. But they, they both, they're both considered different quotients. Um, yeah, so let's do some problems with different quotients. Let f of x equals 2x plus 3 d of x plus x minus x squared, k of x equals x over x plus 2, um, find and simplify. f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Is that the version I wanted before? Let's do the b minus a version. f of b minus f of a over b minus a. B. g of x plus h minus g of x over h c. a of a plus h minus b of a over h. Given those functions, compute those three difference quotients. So my function is f of x equals 2x plus 3. What is that? OK, go. What are you? Just choose n, b, or a value. So you can find it 0 and 1. So b equals 0 and f is a and a is 1. Now, why would you choose those two values? Because you, need, you have a function that needs to find output in an input. Yeah, but no random input. What happens when you plug in specific values? That's evaluating, right? But you have to be given something to evaluate. Here, I'm telling you, B and A. Okay. Okay, so then 2B two, two plus 3 minus 2A plus 3 all over B minus A. Does everyone agree? 
parentheses. <laughs> now it's fine. All right. What happened there? You see this huge expression, don't get daunted, don't just take one piece at a time. First find f of b, right? And what is f of b? Well, it means I go to f. Everywhere I see an x, I put a b. So first I find f of b, write it down. That's f of b right here. Minus, once I put a minus sign, I open parentheses. And then I want to write f of a. What is f of a? Well, I go to f. And ever I see an x, I replace it with a. Then I divide it by b minus a. Hence, we have this expression. Now, find and simplify. Distribute that in the negative to the 2a plus 3. 2b plus 3 minus 2a minus 3 over b minus a. What happens now? Combine the threes. Well, the threes actually kill each other, right? Plus yeah. three, minus three. Factor out the two. So this becomes 2b minus 2a over b minus a. You factor out the two, you have a b minus a over b minus a. Cancel those because there's a multiplication. So the answer is two. B. G of x plus h minus g of x all over h. What's that equal? Well, g of x is this, so it's 2 plus? 2 plus x plus h in parentheses. x plus h uh, minus in parentheses x plus h. Right, that's your g of x plus h. You go to g, every you see an x, you put it in x plus h. It's not correct to write this down and then put a plus h at the end, which happens often enough, but that's not what it means. g of x plus h means go to the g, every you see an x, put x plus h, put it in parentheses, that's g of x plus h, minus open parentheses and what do I put over here? Just uh, g of x, which is exactly what this thing is. Now what? Factor here. This should be the negative. Okay, 2 plus x plus h. What happens here? Coil. Coil. So that's going to be what? x squared plus 2x plus, plus h squared. squared minus, now I distribute this guy, 2 minus x plus x squared all over h. Is that fine? It's not fine. Parentheses. Here. Why? There's a negative sign in front of it. That has to be distributed. This is how it's going to get you. I'm warning you. St. Javon never told you. Be very careful with your parentheses. After a negative sign, always just open them, just to be safe. Now let's distribute this guy. That's 2 plus x plus h minus x squared minus 2xh minus h squared minus 2 minus x plus x squared all over h. Now what happens? Two's cancel. Two's cancel. Two minus two. X cancels. X minus X. X squared cancels. Minus X squared plus X squared. That's it. That's it. So I have H minus two X H minus H squared all over H. And we can cancel this H, right? You can't. And then go to register. No, you can't. This is not multiplication. No, you can't cancel that H. Right? Because pluses or minus signs are separating terms. You have to factor it out. What are we left with? H minus two. One, it's one, one minus, minus two, two x, x minus h. Minus h. Now there's a multiplication. Now you cancel. And that is the answer. 
Um, some commentary on these two. When you're finding a difference quotient and you're asked to simplify it, do not consider your job done until you cancel the original denominator. Let me actually just write that down. To fully simplify the difference quotient. So notice in the first part, I cancel that B minus A. In this part, I have to end up going on until I cancel that H. Why? When I talk about where a difference quotient comes from and why it's important and how we're going to use it, there will come a point where you're going to want to plug in, say, H equals 0. And because you can't divide by 0, it's a problem to have the H there, and so you really want to get rid of it. Um, uh, but for now, we'll stop there. So that's it. Again. We have not finished 1.1, so there, the homework is not due yet. However, we will have a quiz on Tuesday on everything that I've done today. And you should practice the quiz one, the blank version, and compare your answers and let me know if there are issues. And I think that's it. I will see you guys on Tuesday. Any questions?